morning everybody thanks for uh, joining us again we'll just give another minute to, this is it. just coming up to 10 o'clock hi to everybody on youtube it's nice to see uh, a few different faces we're obviously in different time zones this morning uh, so we can hopefully have some we've got some people from australia now or, already do a quick uh, a quick on screen poll again like i did last night you see where everybody is this uh, this morning so there you go you should be able to see uh, a poll on the screen if you can click where you are yeah there you go as i suspected most of the uk europe australia new zealand we've got a few in japan as well i can see one or two in uh, japan i can see uh, takashi give us a wave there you go. Okay. Greetings all. You can see the uh, results there of uh, where we're at. Most of us are in uh, in the UK and a uh, few in Europe. But it's nice to see a few friends from uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. I'm impressed. This is uh, somebody uh, doing an early start in uh, in America. Right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the virtual 3d convention of the stereoscopic society it's we're uh, this morning going to have one or two historical talks uh, about 3d photography for the first hour and then some technical uh, shows and talks uh, for the second hour from about 11 o'clock onwards and uh, what i'd like to do uh, initially is show a little short video for about five or six minutes which explains the history of the society, but also it shows the connection with the society's folio uh, groups, which uh, initially were all UK based, but slowly started going to uh, places overseas and with America and Australia. And so then the first talks we have this morning are, are from Australia. So just bear with me, I'll uh, play the little video. All the uh, co-hosts can turn the cameras off as well, please. In fact, it, it, it does work a bit better if everybody uh, mutes their cameras. Uh, this will be a side-by-side -side, uh, presentation format, so you do need sort of mirror viewers or resize your Zoom window so that you can uh, free view. The Stereoscopic Society was founded in 1893, so recently we have been celebrating 125 years and are the oldest 3D photography club in the world. Charles de Vera was the founder, initially calling it the Stereoscopic Postal Exchange Club. And as the name suggests, the members circulated images for each other to see and critique. Three years later, we became known as the Stereoscopic Society. Some of the earliest images relating to the society are by Robert Corperman, the fourth president from 1920 until 1925. There are several creatively posed family images of his children, Herbert and Kathleen. In 1904, he used this family portrait as a Christmas card. The next president, was Dr. William Reginald Grove, who steered the society for 23 years. In 1927, he invited members to his hometown of St. Ives in Cambridgeshire for the first weekend reunion. In the background here is the Bridge of Sighs at St. John's College, Cambridge. Dr. Grove is noted for his character studies, with very natural poses, often illustrating long forgotten crafts. And from his travels in Europe in the 1930s, we see a Zeppelin airship. Photos of Finland in the early 1900s are by James Stuart Hills, who had been a member of the Guard of Honour at Queen Victoria's funeral. 
He was a member of the Society for over 40 years and Vice President for about half that time. Don't worry, he's just sleeping. The growth of the Society around the world is owed to Walter Cotton, who was founder of the American branch of the Stereoscopic Society early in 1919, which in later years would become the Stereoscopic Society of America, and this year is celebrating 100 years. A few years later, Walter and his wife Rose left the United States and went to Australia, where he also founded the Australian branch of the Society. Harry Tregellis on the right was the heart and soul of stereophotography in Australia and secretary of the Australian branch for 42 years. He is shown here with Norm Peters. During the Second World War, Harry sent food parcels to members in Britain. Richmond Strong was Stereoscopic Society American branch secretary from 1938 until 1954. He founded the Transparency Section and Participation in the Overseas Folio. This still exists and continues to circulate 3D photographs between the United Kingdom, America, Australia and New Zealand. Among the collection of archive images from Stuart Hills are a selection from the coronation of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth in 1937. We see the Household Cavalry, And as the Lord Mayor of London passes by, we can see people using periscopes to see over the crowds. There's even a lady taking a selfie. Another large selection of images shows the life of long-time UK member John Singleton. There are many family photos, including some interesting early colour processes. Although only 2D, this is the earliest Stereoscopic Society group photo we have, taken during the outing to St Ives arranged by Dr Groves in 1927. Dr Groves is seated in the centre of this 3D photo in a slightly later gathering in 1936 at Matlock in Derbyshire. This photo by David Starkman is taken in 1983 outside the Palace Hotel in Buxton, for the Joint Stereoscopic Society Convention and International Stereoscopic Union Congress, with attendees from all over the world. There are some you may know. David Birder, who organised the convention, with Lou Smouse. And on the right are Paul Wing and David Starkman. Arthur Gerling also helped to organise the convention. And is seen here with Claire Wing and Paul Wing, who played an accompaniment to his own show. Jean Soulas of France says Santé with Alan Griffin of Australia, who is seen here on the right with fellow Australians. Valerie Lowe and well-known stereo photographer Pat Whitehouse who is seen admiring the amazing viewers of Hugo de Vice of the Netherlands. From one of the books and outings, we have a classic Susan Pinsky photo of a bus full of 3D nuts. And a different vintage of 3D nuts from 1991 in Southport. Note the comic on the right showing how not to use a 3D camera. More recently, our conference in 2017 was at the Angel Hotel in Cardiff. And finally, back to the Palace Hotel in Buxton in 2018, which I'm pleased to say has several familiar faces from 35 years ago. Thank you and happy anniversary to all our members and 3D friends around the world. Hope you enjoyed that. It was a little information about who we are as a society, but also the international co connection. Which means what I'd like to do now is welcome.
Carlton Wright, who is president and editor of the Sydney Stereo Camera Club. He's been a member of the club for over 40 years. He's extremely proud that the club has been the first in the PSA Internet Club competition for two years in a row, and three members were in the top 10 in the 2019 PSA Who's Who in 3D, including Carlton. So, and then the, you've also assisted in publishing the Sydney in 3D, which is a, a wonderful colour anaglyph book, and the other histories of Australian stereo photographers. And it's uh, about this that you're going to tell us this morning. So, morning, Carlton. Good morning. Good evening, Good evening rather. You're in Australia. <laughs> 7 p.m. So, thank, so you. thank you. I have a week. Hopefully that's, that's all right. right. I think you're, you're breaking up a little bit uh, compared to what you were earlier. Um, you're, you're okay, carry on. What's your name? Hey, hey, no, 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 no. Sorry, I don't know who that was. Go, go ahead, Carl. Oh, sorry. I, I, Sorry, I, I, I made a mistake of muting everybody. <laughs> Go ahead, start again. <laughs> okay, it's okay, Andrew. Andrew. This is this quite, is quite a, a good thing for me to talk on because our club. Oh, you've got, you've got bad feedback. Mm. Well, try this again. Is that any better? Is that any better for the uh, feedback? feedback? There's a little bit of feedback when you talk. But, uh, go, say again, let's keep talking, see how, how it goes. So this is, so this uh, is the book uh, that, we put, that we put together, together. Uh, last, uh, last year, uh, and a cliff book, which is uh, still on in Amazon. And as Andrew said, we do have a couple of other books. Um, this one is uh, the stereo uh, photographers in three different eras, the glass and paper era, the uh, transparency era, and of course our wonderful digital era. And uh, one of our past presidents Peter Docker comes from an illustrious family of five generations of stereo photographers and I'll be talking about Ernest and Joseph Docker in this uh, presentation as well. So having said that, I'm going to now move it on to uh, some photographs to which I will talk to, hopefully successfully without a lot of feedback. It's like I have to. I trust you uh, are able to see that. It's a universal view. But meeting. Um, the, uh, it might have been feedback from me. I still had the uh, original sound turned on for the uh, uh, video which I think might have been causing the, the early problems on your sound. If you want to unplug your headset, you might might be better now. Okay, hopefully that's uh, a little better. Oh, that, that's, that's perfect, thanks. Sorry, that was my fault, sorry. And the image is okay? I hope. So. We're, we're not seeing, uh, oh yeah, your image is fine. You're not sharing, obviously, yeah. No, I think it's probably best just to do the images and I'll talk over the images. Uh, in the foreword to these books, I highlighted that the first stereo photograph still in existence was one taken by Thomas Glaster of Professor John Smith in 1855. And there he is in the uh, chemistry lab. Carlton, have you shared your screen? 
I, I have. Do you not see? You can see, yeah, Carlton, but nothing else. Ah. Hmm. Back to that. Is Good, we've better? got it now. Yes. And no other interference? That's no, perfect now, thanks. So, as I, I might start again, in the foreword to these books, I highlighted that the first stereo photograph still in existence was one taken by Thomas Galaster of um, Professor John Smith in 1855. And here he is in the chemistry laboratory at Sydney University for which he was a founding professor. He was especially keen on this form of photography and took many images of the construction of Sydney University. And I think he might be the one in the top hat in this photograph. And here is another photograph that he took of the construction. And that's quite a, that a famous hall at Sydney University to which my son actually went <laughs> to that university. In the early days, there were roughly equal numbers of amateurs and commercial stereo photographers because it was so new, they actually helped each other in a large way in learning the skills and obtaining equipment and chemicals. The latter is no little affair. For instance, an early amateur was Joseph Docker, who I uh, just mentioned was the first of six <laughs> generations of stereo photographers who are uh, members of many members of our club or previous types of organizations. Joseph was a surgeon and corresponded with Fox Talbot around 1850. He made his own camera and shipped glass plates and chemicals from the UK to Sydney, which of course took months. Then by bullock tray, uh, 180 miles from Sydney to his property near Newcastle. In this photograph, you'll see Ernest and um, his father, Joseph. Now Ernest was a uh, judge, so Ernest is a younger one on my left and traveled New South Wales uh, along the court trail and took many photographs uh, doing so. Joseph was to be the vice president of the first amateur photography club of New South Wales in 1872. And Ernest uh, was actually president between 1898 and 1909. It should be commented on that a fair proportion of those photographers in this club early club were stereo photographers. Here's a Ernest Docker uh, photograph at the uh, Katoomba, three sisters, of three sisters, colorized, of course. Sorry to interrupt, Carlton, but do you have one of the zoom palette controls visible? Because we've got a little rectangle sort of floating over your image, which is usually one of the zoom palettes. If you could move it right to the left or uh, either left or right. Um, yeah, the, that, that's the one, yeah. Uh, please move this. Keep snapping back to the same place by the looks of it. Looks at uh, what a nasty thing. Please move this window away from, I can't read it. Hmm. Seems to go away if I touch it. Hmm. 
Uh, After I a few things, it does fade, fade away, but uh, it's there the majority of the time. I uh, can't seem to get rid of it. I'm sorry. Okay. No, not to worry. It, it fades away after a few seconds. So this is actually a photograph of the first uh, field um, uh, uh, um, outing by the New South Wales Photography Society, of which, as I said, um, probably half were stereo photographers. As mentioned, there were numerous commercial stereo photographers, one being the aforementioned William Glaster, another key stereo photographer, the pair were William and Thekla Hetzner. Um, now, Thekla being the wife, we often forget the women, and in Thomas's case, at least, it was Thekla who did most of the development work and even operated the camera. They published a very popular series of photographs of early Sydney around 1860. And this photograph is on George Street Post Office. And um, just as a by the way, I took a before and after type of photograph of many of Hetzer's photographs. And certainly the streetscape looks very different today. In December 1858, Hetzner and amateur photographers, including Smith, Depp Jevons, Dalton, Moresby, Harvey and Ward, exhibited their work. Many early practitioners were members of a stereoscopic exchange club. As for the Stereoscopic Society, there was no formal strand branch until 1924 or 25. But they were participating members of the UK society in Australia as far back as 1906. By the way, the Stereoscopic Society, of course, is still operating and exchanging between Australia and New Zealand. And we'll talk about that later. Apart from Sydney, the main key hotspots for stereo photography were Melbourne, Tasmania, and New Zealand. My favourite photograph, photographers from these regions are J.H. Harvey, Thomas Nevin and William Williams, respectively. Now, this photograph is of a Victorian amateur photography club and their field outing. So here's another uh, Harvey photograph called Man on a Sawmill Tramway. I mentioned uh, Thomas Nevin, he's from Tasmania. And uh, he started off his photography taking photographs of convicts in Tasmania uh, and soon went into stereo photography. Here he is uh, with a stereo viewer. And another photograph of his at Hobart in Tasmania um, called the Rocking Stone, taken in 1890 or so. And William Williams is actually from New Zealand and he has some beautifully, uh, nicely um, resolved images good resolution images. Here's an example of his family in 1890. His son actually uh, also went in and took stereo photographs as well. Four key events reflect some of our most interesting early stereo photographs. They were celebrations of Australia's Federation in 1901 which included a visit by the future King George III and America's White Navy Fleet. So here's a photograph of a Minnesota, uh, an American ship, naturally. And here's a photograph of um, the future King George III. And he was at that time a Duke of York. And another photograph of the celebrants here. 
uh, lots of people and perfect for stereo photography. Many of these images were taken by the Rose Stereograph Company and their photographers. Second uh, event uh, was um, uh, all the explorations of Antarctica from 1911 to 1916. Some of these amazing images were taken by my favorite stereo photographer, Frank Hurley. And um, many of you possibly know that um, he was on board the ship Endurance when it was wrecked by ice. And um, Narrowly, narrowly escaped. But Hurley took photographs in these very difficult conditions with huge big glass stereo cameras, as you can see here. And here's a, um, a photograph of himself with one of his cameras. But he had a long life in 3D, right up to the color transparency era. And um, moving from Antarctica, and this is the wreck of a Clyde in Macquarie Island, uh, right up to World War II. And this one uh, was taken in Syria and images uh, of uh, Australian and French troops fraternizing, 1915. But he was also uh, very prolific in the first Great War. And uh, here's uh, one of his um, 2D photographs, but he did take a lot of 3D and he was famous, and this is why I, uh, I'm showing it to you, for creating montages of two or three glass plates and putting them together to reflect what he really saw and felt rather than what he could actually take in practical timing. Another World War I photographer was Colonel Charles Snodgrass Ryan, who was a, in charge of a medical corps at Gallipoli. And he was able to take these photographs uh, before they banned uh, soldiers taking their cameras to the war front for obviously uh, political reasons, propaganda reasons. They did not like the uh, reality of war to be shared back home. This uh, couple of images was at an armistice for, that they arranged uh, with the Turks um, to get the dead off the fields. And here's uh, Major Ori is uh, requesting armistice. And uh, this is uh, some of the dead Turk uh, soldiers that were uh, um, lifted and taken back to their own um, side. And often uh, both the Turks and the uh, Australian troops helped each other carry each other's troops. So it was an amazing time, given what they'd just been through, this cooperation. Another key event was uh, the building of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Um, and that started in 1923. And here you'll see uh, images that AJ Perrier uh, took from the top of the bridge. And he obviously demonstrated no fear of heights. So with that, I'm going to pull back to myself, hopefully. Oh, might stop sharing, that might be the easiest way of doing that. <laughs> Put back my video. So I hope that <laughs> despite all those problems, you got to see it. <laughs> yeah, it was um, great. We could, uh, Andrew, make a, a clean copy for your YouTube. <laughs> that might be a good idea. Yeah, it wasn't too bad. It, it was. Uh, very high up in the image, so in the sky most of the time, and it did fade away after a few seconds. But uh, yeah, we, we, we can always uh, 
try and re edit something if necessary. But that was a fascinating talk. And so, are these images in uh, in various archives or? Uh... Well, as I said, um, some of those images are in this book here. Uh, but I did put together uh, this book, um, which has all those images and a lot more. Plus, there are um, um, short video uh, shows I put together for each of those three periods, the uh, 1850 to 1950 period and so forth. Um, if we had time, I'd show it to you, but <laughs> I think it's probably time to move on. Uh, um, I did refer to some of the um, history of uh, stereoscopic uh, um, organizations. Uh, there were ones before the stereoscopic society, and um, it seems probably likely that many of them moved from one organization to the next, to the next as one was founded and another one sort of declined. <laughs> and the two people that know a lot more about that are Ray Moxon from Australia and Max Power from New Zealand that are also on the line. So they, if yeah, you have bring, any questions, they're the ones to ask. <laughs> bring Ray into it, a conversation as well. Yeah, that's uh, good morning, Ray. Good morning. <laughs> good, good afternoon. Good, oh, good evening. evening. Sorry, sorry. Good evening. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wasn't going to say very much, really. I mean, the the Stereoscopic Society Australian branch, as it was known in the early days, as some years back we changed it to the Australian Stereoscopic Society. It still exists as a folio. Uh, there are not many Australians now in the OX folio, which goes to the UK and the US and New Zealand. I think there's three remaining in the... Uh, there was an Australian folio, it's now died. Uh, and there is a, uh, an ANZ, Australian New Zealand folio, which is still going. Uh, I think from Australia, there's six or eight members and a similar number from New Zealand. So it's, it's not, I mean, people have, uh, the slide, slide area has really slipped away very quickly on us. Uh, for a long time, I had a film recorder, so I was able to put my digitals in the slides and stick them in the folio. But eventually, as the computers got updated, it only worked on XP, and I finally gave it away to one of our friends in Melbourne who was keener than I was. The uh, Other than that, there's not really much to say. I mean, Tregellis, you've mentioned he was the secretary of the folio for many, many years. Back in about 19, the Stereoscopic Society or the Australian Stereoscopic Society held annual con uh, biannual conferences. And at the biannual conference back in 1973, they decided the, the Sydney members and the Melbourne members decided to form their own clubs within their own cities and then carry on with conferences organised alternatively by Sydney and Melbourne. And that's carried on ever since. Uh, except for last year, we missed out, but that's that's on next year. We missed out because of COVID, of course. When I say, uh, actually, it was this year we were supposed to have our conference and we put it off because of COVID, even though the COVID situation is almost non-existent here. But it would have stopped people uh, traveling from New Zealand and the like. That's 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 it for me, I think. <laughs> Thank you. It's interesting to hear yeah. how the folios uh, sort of did, did start. And uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's a shame that there aren't as many. But uh, as you say, there's not many people that still taking slide transparency photos to be then posting them uh, around to other stereo photographers. But, uh, but there are still a few. Yeah, there are a few. And the, the thing people, I think there's only one of our members that are still shooting new stuff on film. Uh, I was converting digital to film with, with myself and Nancy's photos. 
So the, the more recent photos would come from us and from that other guy. Uh, what we do have in the folio these days is a USB stick. So we put our latest digital photos in and they go around with the slides. So that adds a bit of extra information. Yeah. It's a very small part of the 3D world in Australia, the folio. That's great. Okay. I'll bring uh, Max uh, Powin briefly, or I was going to do it, was it disappeared to? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> um, basically, what I was going to say is that I do have a collection of William Williams images, which I downloaded off the Turnbull Library uh, about a year ago. Uh, with regards to folios, I thought we had three folios that go from Australia to New Zealand, the L, J and K. And as far as well, I know, they're still active. Yeah, they are active. The ones within Australia... There was an Australian folio as well. It's no longer active. The ANZ um, folio is still active, yes. Right. The other thing is that New Zealand's folios have all gone digital. Um, some time ago, Lou Smell set up a, uh, a folio between USA and New Zealand, and it, was, it consisted of 20 images from each person. Uh, generally took quite a bit longer to do the, the round. Uh, but then Aust uh, USA decided to drop out and we've kept it going, but it's all digital now and we just do it in New Zealand. And that's, that's probably about all. Trouble with New Zealand is we don't, we're not that active as a group. We're more active independently and we just meet twi twice a year. So we're uh, certainly not, not as active as most other clubs are. Uh, I get a chance uh, to go to Australia when they have their convention on. And uh, before me, there was uh, Rex, Julian and Chris, but uh, unfortunately, Rex uh, passed away a couple of years ago. So I'm probably the only one from New Zealand now that <laughs> goes to the, uh, the conventions in Australia from a New Zealand point of view, uh, which, which is good to have because it's, it's nice to see uh, how other people do things. The other thing I, I will comment is to do with the Zoom meetings. I do think that these Zoom meetings are marvellous. And even when we get back to absolute normal, whatever that will be, I think it'd be quite good to still retain the Zoom meetings. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that the one thing that's come out from the pandemic is forcing us all to go online and, and use the Zoom meetings. And it's been a revelation, even just within the UK, we've been able to interact with so many more members uh, than we were doing just by meetings in London and Coventry and Edinburgh. There's only so many people can uh, travel uh, those distances. But uh, we were saying that there's still, uh, there's still OX uh, folios uh, going around the world, but we're, we're not quite sure where, <laughs> where they are. I've, I've actually counted eight, eight of them. Uh, OX1, six, five, nine, seven, 10, 11, and 14, but I haven't seen any of them. And the only overseas folio that's in New Zealand at the moment has just arrived, which, which is L from Australia. And that I don't know where the other ones are. Well, we've got 100 people uh, on the call. If, if anybody knows where an OX folio is, whether with, with yourself or just within your own club group, pop it in the chat. <laughs> It'd be nice to know, to know that they are still circulating. I, I understand the OX folio is currently with Jeff Waldo in the US. Or, or some of them are. Yeah, some of the OX folios are with Jeff uh, Waldo. And because of uh, COVID, they haven't been sent through. There's a uh, one of your guys, Ken, uh, Ken Wade, I don't know whether he's here today, would know knows something about the OX folio. Uh, Do you Ken, know Ken, Ken Ford? Uh, is user with a folio. Uh, might, might be Ken Wade, I'm not sure, but Ken, Ken Ford's very. Uh, very uh, big in the folio, has been one of the secretaries for many years. It was uh, on the meeting last night. I don't know whether he's uh, here this evening. You can always type in the chat. If it's, uh, but, uh, no, that's great. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, it's been uh, fascinating to uh, be able to connect up right around the globe in a meeting like this. We've, 
unless it had been an ISU Congress, we, you would never have uh, <laughs> been coming to our uh, little conventions. I don't think it's. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, thank you very much to Carlton for a very interesting talk. And to well, thank you for inviting uh, me. And as Andrew knows, we also run a Zoom uh, uh, teleconference um, from the Sydney Club on every third Thursday of the month at the moment, which we started mm. after COVID, of course, and it works quite well. But you're now in a position you can have physical meetings and you're doing that one night of the week and then a follow-up Zoom meeting for those that didn't make it to the meeting with distance. That's right. I think yes. that's, that's a nice idea. Well, well, we have a lot of out-of-town members, which is a little bit to do with that too. So, so uh, we thought it was a good idea to keep it going. So we have the meeting on the Tuesday, and then the following the Thursday of the same week, we have our Zoom meeting, not as enormously attended because people have been to the meeting and seen everything anyway, but still, it's a good way to get together. And it's, it's nice to see people like Andrew there at times from time to time, and uh, Stephen O'Neill, and uh, a few others, and Melbourne members, and Max Power from New Zealand. So it's uh, it's a good way to get together. So we, we're going to continue on. Yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed them. And at the moment, with the way their uh, time zones uh, for uh, sort of summertime and wintertime for, for you guys uh, have moved by an hour, it's quite convenient. You know, it's just a, an evening for you and a, a, a reasonable mid-morning for us. A, a couple of months mm -hmm. ago, it was a very early uh, sort of pre-breakfast start for me to, to come and join you. <laughs> but no, that's great. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll move on hey. to another guest. I yeah. really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Oh. Yeah, that's great. So thank you for that. Following on with the theme of historical uh, talks, we have one of our own members, Derek Medhurst, who has been a member for a few years and is a stereo card collector as well as uh, shooting his own modern 3D photos, which by coincidence he was a winner of the Tregellis medal from the Sydney uh, Club in the Southern Cross competition in 2016, I believe. We've also had success with the Chicago Lighthouse uh, competition, you were telling me. So it's uh, for the, the Humor Award. I, I believe you, you'll be seeing that uh, image within your talk. So welcome, Derek. Well, looking forward to hearing more about your collecting activities. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, see where we can get to. I can see you. Right. Um, okay. Can't see myself, so I assume you can. Yeah, you're you're good. You're. Uh... Oh, I'm, I'm saying that. Hang on. I was continuing with the picture of you. So. Yeah, mate. Try that. Let's try that. Yeah, there you go. Sorry. Right. Okay. Um, yep. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Wherever you are. Um, so I was. Uh, uh, really impressed and jealous by Ray's sunny Australian background there on his talk because I'm sitting here um, and over top of the monitor I can look out into a dank grey sky with raindrops rolling down the window panes. Um, so uh, uh, thank you Ray for making that a really good morning for me. Uh, anyway, I've really only got a few minutes. I think I've been given about 15 minutes here, um, partly my own fault for only popping up too late. Uh, just to talk a little bit of a brief peek into my historical uh, stereo card collection. Um, there is only going to be one of my own pictures here. Uh, the cards that I collect are pretty much, uh, pretty much involved in my overall photographic interest. Uh, uh, many, many decades I've been interested in anything photography, probably back to uh, when I was in single digit age. Uh, which is probably a couple of years ago now, um, if I'm allowed to admit it safely, and I suppose that is one of the things on Zoom, you can't get to me easily at a meeting. Um, the majority of my photography is really 2D, uh, although obviously the fact that I'm here, the fact that I take stereo, the fact that I collect them, 
um, obviously indicates that I've got pretty good fascination for stereo and uh, that added third dimension. Um, and, and that extends to taking my own and to, uh, to looking at others. I think looking at the stereos or trying to think about my stereo photography um, without digging into all of the archives of any photographs I might have, my recollection is that I probably dabbled in a few uh, sequential um, shots back in the 70s, early 80s, um, but it didn't really amount to an awful lot. And I really only got stereo cameras um, probably about 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, started off with, I think, a realist um, and now use um, a Fuji W3. I think probably my interest in old stereo cards probably has grown over that 15 to 20 years. Um, although I may well have had some earlier, I'm just not really 100% sure. Um, the, I think that's just old age playing tricks on my memory, not COVID. Um, but uh, I think early on in the in the collecting stereo stuff, for want of a better word, um, I realised I ought to uh, concentrate on specific areas just to uh, to avoid a completely random selection of pictures that I happen to like. Um, so I did move fairly um, fairly soon into two distinct themes um, that I showed. Um, I'll start to uh, share the screen now, um, if we can, if that is working. Right, um, just a, a quick aside, the, the pictures I'm showing are the actual cards as straight scans. Um, you should be able to view them side by side, um, although there's a little bit of difficulty probably on at least one of them, um, but I haven't edited them. I haven't um, extracted the image uh, from the card. Um, some are faded, some have got a little bit of dirt, um, and many have got the, the sort of typical left-right um, violations that we see on a lot of uh, old stereo cards. But from my point of view, they're, they're the sort of physical artifacts that I collect rather than fully cleaned up digital uh, digital images. Uh, and so the, the first theme that I'm going to touch on that I collect, uh, which is probably the majority by volume, but I'm not sure about the intensity, um, the first theme is cards of places that I've visited, um, either for leisure or work. I've um, been lucky enough to uh, do a little bit of travelling for both of those. Um, and whilst I normally have uh, a camera in my pocket or my bag uh, with various sorts, the, the idea of collecting a sort of a, a, a time machine album, or perhaps more accurately, more than, uh, more than one album, uh, just attracted me to the idea of uh, looking to see what a place looked like that I'd actually been to uh, more recently, but what it was like 70, 80, 100, 150 years ago. So each of the, each of the cards here um, actually prompts some memories. It's not just about the content and quality uh, of the image, although obviously those are, those are good as well. And I try to avoid buying something that's uh, too poor quality unless it's got particular resonance for a place I visited. Um, but each one's got uh, got personal memories. This one, as I'm sure you realise, Notre Dame in Paris, where I've been uh, a number of times on both um, pleasure and work, although actually I think the work trip was also pleasurable. Um, it's also now um, rather um, poignant with the uh, with the fire in Notre Dame, but this uh, this picture would have been post 1859 because the spire is there in the background. Uh, but uh, nice, broadly empty roads uh, around in front of it. Uh, zooming over the other side uh, of the Atlantic, um, there's one a uh, picture of the Alamo Mission um, in San Antonio, Texas, where I visited uh, some years ago two or three visits to friends out there in Houston uh, and around the Houston area um, who took me on a, um, a trip around San Antonio, uh, went to that and a few of the missions. 
And this is, as you can see, a Keystone com company card. Um, and I'm quite agnostic about the type of cards. I don't mind um, getting a good card from one of the big commercial organisations or from uh, an anonymous amateur if it's a, an interesting picture. Um, I don't worry which, uh, which source it's from. Um, but I think I have, got, I have got to the stage now where I'm tending not to add cards to places I've visited and I've got, already got cards just because of the sheer volume. Um, I'm, I'm trying to do it for pleasure, not just for the sake of uh, collecting more cards. And um, <clears throat> another place I visited, this one is considerably nearer home, although it doesn't say so on the front and uh, you may not, uh, not recognise it, but on the back, and I sort of recognise it myself and some of the signposts that help. Um, that's the frontage of Cannon Street Station in the city of London. Um, that one has got clear, um, clear recollections from me having worked in the city of London many times. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that any of those people would have been me, or I would have been any of those. Uh, I certainly wouldn't have been wearing a top hat, and possibly not even a boater. Um, but uh, it's fascinating just looking at the uh, looking at the city people coming out of there. There's already uh, one young lady there, but uh, uh, that's the only one I can see. Whereas nowadays, uh, well, apart from the problem. Um, of COVID, pre-COVID, there would have been uh, equal numbers of males and females pouring out of that station, considerably more. Um, and also back in the 80s, 90s, um, there was a very good photographic shop uh, right on the edge of um, the, the station concourse there, which was a little bit of a trap for me. And I, uh, I do remember spending a good few, um, good few pounds in the shop because you just couldn't avoid looking in the window as you went past. Yeah. So that's sort of obviously uh, another one and some of just a few of the memories that I've got there. I move on to the, the second theme now, and this one is really probably the one that uh, has taken over the passion for me. And it's cards relating to where I live in Seven Oaks in Kent in the southeast of England, for those who may not know. Um, I've lived within Seven Oaks and within the area for most of my life. Um, and just as, a, as an aside about the Stereoscopic Society Zoom meetings, uh, it was on one of these Zoom meetings that Stephen O'Neill and I actually found that we both um, lived in Seven Oaks. Uh, Stephen lived there for the early part of the years and we've had uh, discussions and emails about um, our recollections of Seven Oaks. So that was another spin-off benefit of Stereo Society Zoom meetings. Uh, anyway, just coming back, I sort of collect cards by Seven Oaks photographers uh, and cards of the area can buy anonymous photographers uh, or anybody um, recognised. I haven't tried to um, expand into 2D photographs um, too much um, of the area in general because there are a lot of other local historians who've got much... Uh, uh, much more substantial collections of general photographs. So I do try to concentrate on uh, on ones on stereo or named uh, professional photographers. Now, interestingly, there are only two professional photographers in the town uh, that, as far as I can see, um, who actually produce stereo cards. There were quite a few in the 19th century um, who produced carte de visite, other portrait and some scenery. Uh, but only only two of them, um, and coincidentally the first two that I've identified, identified who produced stereo cards. Now this one you may see from the right hand side by a photographer called uh, Inskip. It's Henry Guy Inskip. Uh, this chap opened the first permanent uh, photographic studio that I've been able to ascertain uh, in Seven Oaks in 1864. Although prior to that, there were a couple of uh, travelling photographers who passed through um, either with a, a travelling photographic caravan studio uh, and one who seemed to visit from London perhaps one day a week, as far as I can see. Um, now, this, uh, this shot here, uh, apart from the interest, it's in the sort of upper narrow area of the high street, uh, extremely visible today. Um, the shops haven't changed very much at all. Um, and the, the particular reason, or a particular reason I like this, um, as well as just the scene, 
is that the shop frontage just to the right of the lamp, um, I'm pretty sure is the shop frontage of Henry Guy Imskip. Um, the studio, from what I can see, would have been in a yard at the back of that shop. Um, but whilst I can't um, enlarge, can't get enough details off of the off of the card to confirm 100% that there are stereo um, or mono images in the window, I'm pretty sure that that is it. It's at 26 High Street. Uh, another one of um, Inskip's cards is the Duchess Walk in Knoll Park. Um, this is a large park um, around about 900 to 1000 acres, which is right next to the town. Um, it's been in the ownership of the Sackvilles since around about 1600 or so. Um, now most of the most of the park is still owned by the Sackvilles or the Knoll Estates, um, although the part of the house is open and managed by the National Trust here in the UK. Uh, the, some of you may have noticed that his um, name uh, sticker has moved from the right hand side of the card and at various times he did use the uh, put his name on stickers either on the right hand side of the card or on the reverse and this one um, it is on the reverse. Um, it's a very very long straight um, walk which is still there in the park nowadays. The third in skip uh, photograph is the rear of the Crown Hotel in Seven Oaks, and this this was effectively the the go to hotel in town, and it later became the Royal Crown. Uh, and I'm sure, um, although I haven't found one yet, I'm sure you must have taken pictures of the frontage of the hotel. Um, what I find interesting on this one is that he took the trouble to go round to the back of the hotel, um, take a picture. Um, of that area with some of the workers in there and there are a couple of guests as well. Um, I'm not sure that that would have been um, a regular um, photographic subject for a lot of people um, at that time, but it just gives sort of an indication, I think, into his mindset about trying to uh, uh, trying to record an awful lot that was going on in the town, which he only stayed in for two or three years, by the way. And the final, um, the final picture here, stereo picture by Inskip, is London Road uh, in Seven Oaks. Um, that is still there. The the house, the scene's just about recognisable. Certainly, the houses in the far distant um, are there now, and they're clearly identifiable. Uh, the ones towards the camera have changed a bit uh, on there. Um, now, my my sort of theory is that one of the reasons that prompted um, or that may have prompted Inskip to start up the studio when he did, was that the uh, the railway had come direct to Seven Oaks um, a couple of years before he opened the studio in eighteen in eighteen sixty two in fact, um, and the British Journal of Photography was um, promoting in um, in eighteen sixty the idea of going to Seven Oaks amateurs going to Seven Oaks to take photographs. Um, so I think he may well have latched onto the idea of stereos to sell to some early tourists coming through. But this one, in my um, in my thought process, will be completely atypical from a, um, a tourist shot. And I like to think that in combination with the back of the hotel in the last shot, that perhaps he was interested in recording what was actually there in the, in the town, uh, maybe as a sort of quasi local historian, documentary photographer. But I think I like the guy um, for that in particular. Uh, but although he was a, um, a very local photographer, two of his carte de visite portraits of the uh, nobility, the Stanhope family who lived in nearby Chevening House, are held in the National Portrait Gallery and the Royal Collections. Um, so I think he's a little bit more than a simple jobbing pro in the early days of photography. Um, his wife died in 1866 and at the end of that year or early 1867 um, he moved down to Tunbridge and then to Tunbridge Wells where he set up another studio did a lot of um, mono and stereo work again and even in 1878 the British Journal of Photography um, was talking about um, some of the Inskip brand dry plates that he produced so um, somebody from Seven Oaks went on to approve themselves uh, this is the this is the one 
uh, which may cause some difficulties, um, been in discussion with my um, stereo betters. Uh, this is by James Stanger, see on the right hand side, um, who is the second of the two stereo photographers or stereo professional photographers. He actually took over the studio from Stanger, from, sorry, from Inskip. Um, I think there's a, I think this is vaguely um, stereo. Um, there's another opinion that it's pseudo. Um, on real close looking again last night, I even was thinking that it's, uh, uh, the two pictures are actually duplicates. Um, I don't know. If you're having difficulties, apologies, but it is as the card is, and it may well reflect um, some of the difficulties that um, photographers had in those early days and the photo finishers in getting the um, getting the chips or the images on the right, correct side um, back in those days, particularly when uh, there was not too much in the foreground to add the, add the emphasis. Um, that is called that King Beach uh, in 1841 was measured the circumference of just over 28 feet. So that's about nine meters. Um, but I'll move on if you're having difficulty. Um, another Stanger photograph. This is the eastern view of Knoll House, the, uh, the house at the center of the park. Um, this was taken from the private grounds. So Stanger obviously had uh, a good enough relationship with the Sackfields to be allowed into the, uh, into the grounds. Uh, to take that photograph. Not only in the grounds, he was allowed into the house itself. Um, and this is the cartoon gallery, one of the many uh, large rooms in Knoll House. Now, as well as being a photographer, Stang was also a carver and a gilder. Um, so it's possible that uh, he may have carried out some of the works inside the house. And actually gathering these pictures together has made me think that one thing I haven't done yet uh, is contact the National Trust to see if they've got any records of um, who actually worked in the house. I'm sure they have. Um, they may be able to confirm that for me. And the final old um, photographer's photograph, uh, a Stanger, a picture of an out, sorry, apologies, a um, picture of an outbuilding, the place called Item Moat, which is a seven year old, 700 year old moated manor house a few miles southeast of Seven Oaks. Um, slightly less than usual scenic shot again. Um, so he wasn't just taking the main, uh, the main item moat, which is a lot more photogenic than this. Um, another um, connection with um, our elders and betters, um, Princess Louise, who was a daughter of Queen Victoria, visited item moat in 1873. There are stories um, that she was thinking of buying it to get away from what she saw as the overbearing presence of her mother, Queen Victoria. Um, didn't happen, but uh, she may have been thinking of it. Um, after the visit to Item Moat, the local paper reports that the Royal Party went to the Royal Oak Hotel in Seven Oaks for lunch. Um, and then afterwards, uh, Mr. Stanger gets a mention because the party went to Mr. Stanger's photographic establishment, which was about 150 yards from the hotel where they had lunch, and they bought some photographs of item moat. Um, sadly, the local paper doesn't explain whether it was 2D or 3D. Uh, they weren't thinking of somebody 150 years later doing some research, um, don't know what they were thinking of. But I like to think that perhaps um, this might be one of the pictures um, that she bought. Sadly, there don't appear to be any um, pictures by Stanger in the Royal Collection, so I haven't been able to use that as an avenue to confirm. And now 150 years later, um, there is another stereo photographer in Seven Oaks. Um, so I'm gonna cut the, uh, cut the chatter and uh, I'll let somebody else take over. So thank you for listening. That was uh, fascinating, Derek. Nice to see your collection. I turned your camera off to stop it interfering with the YouTube. All oh, right. Put yourself back on. Okay, sorry. I had a note to do. I had a note to do that, and then failed. <laughs> what a, a miserable luckily, thing! Luckily, I found there, there is a control where uh, oh, well. can, uh, can well done. So yeah, th thanks for that. Uh, and we had uh, two or three uh, confirmations that that uh, King Beach is pseudo. Right. A general agreement that uh, that's the case, but a nice photo when it's the right way down. Yes. Well, as I said earlier, I, I don't know whether there's an effect um, having had a, an eye problem with my right eye in the past. You know, um, and it's uh, just still hanging around again now. 
I just wonder whether that has impacted on my ability. Very possible. I don't Might know. Be just incompetent. <laughs> There's a number of people in the club, unfortunately, do, do have eyesight problems, and it's surprising how sometimes uh, pseudo images uh, do escape them. It's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, no, that's a great thank thank you very much for uh, for going through that and uh, hope to see your collection growing in, in the future I, i've asked for people to put any questions for either carlton or yourself uh, or ray or max for that matter in, in the chat although i've not uh, not seen any there's also well, late... there was one question um regarding the date of the notre dame um image if you know the date uh, that I, would be of interest i, I don't all i um all i um, looked at is that it's, it must be after 1859 because 1859 was when the um, when the steeple went up. Uh, but I haven't I haven't looked into it any further than that to try and ascertain a date. I'm afraid, and it's an anonymous one. There's no uh, nothing on the back, so I'm unable to to do that. Sorry, Mike. Well, thanks, sir. Some, it was somebody else asking, but oh right, yes. I apologise to whoever. <laughs> I'm sure somebody uh, somewhere knows. But uh, that was great. And uh, I'd like to thank both yourself and Carlton and uh, Ray and Max in uh, New Zealand. And we've had a, a very interesting uh, first uh, session there with uh, about historical topics. So I'll, uh, I'll spotlight myself and uh, let you all uh, have a rest. So that, yeah, thank you very much for that. I hope everybody enjoyed that. So we we'll tried to make it more of a historical and collectible uh, sort of session. This I'll next just, hour, Andrew, I've just looked at the chat and there's a couple of comments in there. Some John Bunyan saying, were these cards formatted for certain viewers? Um, I, I guess the answer is I don't know. Um, prob prob probably Holmes viewers, but I'm not sure. Um, they're of that standard size. They're all of that standard size. Uh, maybe give or take a quarter of an inch, um, less than a centimetre. Um, Jeff Ogram says, I have a comment, but hasn't... Um... Yeah, I've just asked him to unmute. It's, uh, he should be able to join us. Yes. Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Oh, good. Um, and when I look at the, looked at all those pictures, I think with the problem with some of those uh, things is they're mounting, uh, yes. the separation, because... Yep. You see too much of the mono bit on the wrong image, and you think they're the wrong way around. The right image should have more on the left. Yes. Which, and it, they look the other way around sometimes, but they still look 3D. They're just in, badly put together, I think. Yeah, I think. And, I think and it's yeah. difficult to tell. Yeah, I think, Jeff, that was my, when I yeah. went, mentioned early on that there were the sort of left and right um, so right like relations. That was, what I was, that was what I was trying to refer to um, inexpertly. Um, I think. Yeah. There's a significant number of the cards that I've got do suffer from that. They, they look behind the, 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 the window. It's most peculiar yeah. I, I, sometimes. You know. so for, for me, that it's almost the, the artifact is um, sort of important for me. And that's, what, that's why I didn't um, and haven't. Um, sort of extra. Well, yeah, some of them could do with more separation, I think. Maybe yep. better effect. But anyway, that's it, really. Thank yeah. you. They didn't really have the internet in those days, so we didn't tell them what the window was, did we? <laughs> Absolutely right. Sorry, I've, I've left myself spotlight, I think, while all that was going on. So I hope everybody could hear what was uh, being said. But no, th thank you very much to the speakers this morning. Uh, Carlton's put his email address in the uh, chat for anyone who wants to have a copy of the PDF that he's prepared of, uh, of his talk and, and a lot of those images. I'm sure if uh, if you contact him, you can work out for getting all the copies of Sydney in 3D or the book on early photographers. I believe it, it is on Amazon occasionally uh, around the world, uh, but certainly in, in Australia. Or yeah. if, uh, if that's right, so, and now Club also has some copies as well. So, but you have to join our Club to get get a copy. That's a, that's the only trick. <laughs> I was just going to say that uh, the uh, the Sydney Club is uh, producing a very good uh, digital magazine as well, don't it? Uh... Yes, I think so. Uh, it's called Three D Window, and um, it's um, it's um, 
I received some very good feedback over the years, and Ray is um, thankfully uh, been very, very much involved in that. So I claim to be the um, editor, but um, <laughs> Ray is definitely um, the uh, source behind a lot of the uh, quality. That's great. Uh, thank you to everyone. We'll, uh, we'll move along. Uh, to, thanks, Carlton. Thank you. So next we're going to do some uh, more technical uh, sort of subjects, mainly concentrating on close-up and a little bit of time-lapse. But the first one is, uh, I remember Barry Aldis, who a lot of you will, uh, will know quite well. If I can find him, I'll uh, at least spotlight him so he can give us a wave. He's actually prepared his presentation as a video uh, oh, there you are, Barry. I'll mute you so you can, uh, you can unmute any time you like. But uh, yeah, so it's fairly self-explanatory. Barry's put a little video show together which explains all he's been doing in different kinds of work of close-up and time-lapse and shows the equipment of cameras and other gadgetry that he's using. It's a fascinating show. It uh, lasts about 14 minutes and goes uh, through quite a few different combinations of technology and things. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Barry. It's a marvellous set of shows. Uh, let me, uh, where is he? Let me find him. Let him jump. Come and join me for a second. Morning, Barry. Are you able to unmute? Is it? <laughs> I thought we had made you a co host. You should be able to uh, unmute. And it's not it's muted, muted, it's something, it's something else. Yeah. Yeah, so, sorry, Barry, we're, we're not hearing you. You're not muted. It's your, your microphone's not connected or something. But uh, what, what we would agree to do anyway was uh, ask people to uh, put questions to Barry in the chat if you've got more to, you need to know. It's, uh, we can, uh, there's lots of comments saying how wonderful the images were. And Barry's uh, been one of the people in the society or or the person really who's pushed a lot of members into making AV shows. And he's got a long history right from cine film days 
of making uh, uh, movies, as, as you can see in what he's just shown us, which was a work of art in itself, let alone all the wonderful close-up and time-lapse individual sequences that he's pulled together in that one uh, one session. So that was uh, that was wonderful. But yeah, if you have any questions, if you want to type them in the chat, I'm sure Barry can respond uh, to them there. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry, Barry, we're just not not hearing you. <laughs> no worries. Well, I'll move on to then next is Colin Metherill uh, sent us another little show of what he's been doing with a sort of similar close up of uh, time lapse of flowers and things. So uh, let me find Colin to come and join me. Have you uh, got your video on, uh, Colin? Or do you want me to just play the play your video? Um, <coughs> if you've got it, it will be better if you play, you play it. it. My, my bandwidth is absolutely, absolutely appalling at the moment. Right, OK. So I'll play it. You keep your video off and just talk over it uh, and explain, okay, okay. explain what it was that uh, Yeah, this is just um, a video I did. I bought a bunch of uh, freezers in Sainsbury's, my local supermarket, and stuck them in a vase and put it on time lapse to see what would happen. I'm using a Panasonic um, GX7 camera with the Lumex 3D lens. Similar setup to Barry. In fact, he's been my inspiration for doing all of my time lapse um, photography. I hope you can see it better than I can because that looks absolutely dreadful image to me. But as I said, my download speed is only about two megabits per second. So um, my image is hopeless and the upload speed is even. It's OK. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we, we can hear you fine and your, your video is playing uh, OK from what I can tell. If somebody really good. can pop it in the chat just to confirm. But yeah, I think it's just your, your downloads. Uh, yeah, it's just rubbish. I've normally got, well, just recently I've had a, a download speed of over 250 and an upload speed of about 18. Um, but today it's absolutely useless. Anyway, this this is um, a bunch of freezers which are just opening um, just one at a time. When you start off, of course, you've got no idea what's going to happen. Um, it's all completely down to nature. And um, you start off with a fairly compact bunch of flowers and they get bigger and bigger and bigger, of course, as the flowers open. So it's a bit hit and miss um, and a bit of guesswork here to um, organise the image best. And as you can see, I've got some, I've lost some of the flowers on the right hand side at the moment. But it's all good fun. Um, and I use the same setup as it was in our um, stereoscopic society journal from the Dutchman, whose name I can't pronounce, I can't remember either. Um, uh, he also published it in the ISU journal. Um, and I've used his method and I find it works extremely well. I started off using a W3 for close up work but I never had a great deal of success. I found the image jumped just like that, only it jumped a lot more. And it was jumping forward and back because the width of the image was changing all the time. Um, but with the GX7, I don't get that problem. Um, when I save all the images, they are all precisely the same width and height. Whereas with the W3, um, I got a whole um, range of images, one size and the size changes and they go back to the original size and come off to somewhat different sizes. And it was a bit of a nightmare to watch it at any rate in 3D. 
So this is using the Lumix 3D lens with a yes. couple of washers to adjust the focal length. Yes, um, it was a quite a thin washer. I think it was probably the 0.5 or 0.75 millimeter washer um, because it's a fairly large bunch of flowers. And um, I, I didn't get as close in as you can do. Um, if you've just got one flower, then you need about a one and a half millimeter spacer in in the lens and then you can get right in close and quite a good depth of field as well. What sort of time frame in reality is this? The flowers are dying, presumably it's several days. Is it? Yes, it's um, three or four days. Uh, I take photographs every um, three to four minutes. Um, so you end up with hundreds of photographs every day and often make a video of, with 1500 to 2000 images. Um, that's back to the beginning again. Um, it's all great fun and I really enjoy it. Um, I've also done several other um, things, amaryllis. That is particularly difficult because you start off with a short flower bud uh, and the stem increases by about a, a foot during the opening of the flower. <laughs> it's going again then. Um, well, it seems we can't see you. I'll, I'll put your flowers back on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the amaryllis is quite a challenge because it get, grows in height so much. You keep having to adjust the height of the camera every day or even more and more frequently. So, so presumably your camera is on a power pack of some kind to keep going for days. Oh, yes. Um, I generally have two photo floods, um, LED lights, um, which remains powered um, and the camera is runs off a of, uh, dummy battery off the mains and oh, the, timer, the, time, the camera has got its internal timer which is very handy so that saves um, a load of electrical connections whereas the w3 of course you have to um, uh, put a, a separate timer on it Sorry, someone was asking a question, was it? Yes, Colin, I was just going to say with with um, uh, your amaryllis problem, if you clamp the camera to the amaryllis stem rather than your tripod. <laughs> no, it's not that so it's sturdy. <laughs> oh, oh dear, what a shame. <laughs> yeah. That's great, thanks for that. I'll, uh, uh, I just started just to put a bit of entertainment on uh, while you were still uh, talking because we can't see, uh, see you uh, so well. So... Uh, I'll stop the share. We've already seen the whole thing. Yeah. Come and come back and join you all. And that was great. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Colin, uh, for explaining all that. And obviously, as you saw, Barry's is uh, similar to what Colin's been explaining as a camera set up on some of the things that he, show, he, he showed. One of the neat DIY tricks, which has always uh, impressed me that Barry came up with was the rotation of the flowers in the vase is a, a seven, either a 24 hour or a seven day timer switch that you would put to turn a light on and off in your house while you're uh, out and about and away on holiday. Then the dial rotates. And so with an old CD glued to the top of the rotating timer dial, he then puts his plants on the top and they just steadily rotate for either a day or a week <laughs> and a photograph as they go along. So well done, Barry. It's always nice to have these DIY pound shop solutions. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. Thanks, Colin, for your explanation there. What I'm going to do now is introduce John Chapman. Uh, just go and find him. Hang on a sec. There you go, John. I'll make you a co-host and spotlight you along with me. There you go. So, John, you. <laughs> John's a medical microbiologist, and after 17 years in the NHS, became the North of England manager for Carl Zeiss Light Microscopy Division. And after dealing with all kinds of microscopes, he retired after 25 years, and has since been expanding his interest in 3D imaging. And I've known him for several years, coming to the uh, Bury 3D meetings at Old. And whilst all natural things are of interest, John has found himself to be in a niche of recording micro minerals in 2D and 3D. 
It has always been amazed that people using stereo microscopes could not understand why 2D photography that they took through the microscope didn't resemble what they were seeing through the stereo microscope. And equally amazing and disappointing was the fact that manufacturers of equipment capable of producing 3D images, including confocal imaging, did not make a means of to view the results in true 3D. And at the moment, John's got a selection of his images, which we'll probably see some of them this morning, but they're on the London Stereoscopic Company's uh, monthly gallery on Brian May's uh, site of the London Stereoscopic Company. So it's a pleasure to have you here with us this morning, John, and it was nice of you to step in at fairly short notice to uh, give this uh, interesting talk on stereo microscopy and uh, 3D under the microscope. Okay. Uh, right. Well, good morning, everybody. And um, I think I've got quite a bit to learn from both Barry and Colin. Um, Barry's uh, presentations always astound me. Uh, so next time I see him at Bury, I think I shall be asking him quite a few questions. So the correct title here is Stereo Photo Micrography which is a bit of a mouthful. We'll come to that in a minute. But I think the important thing I feel about this is that um, if you were to look at many objects, you know what they are, whether it's 2D or 1 or 3D. But in the microscopic world, you really can't make out what things are. So the third dimension really helps you to identify things. So a bird, for instance, you know it's a bird because we all know what birds look like. But in the microscopical world, you just don't know what to expect. And of course, you might make a specimen and you're the first person to see it and you want to be able to show other people what it is and to explain it. Now, here's an image of a pixie cup lichen that you can find on uh, stone walls, certainly up in the Dales where I live. And if you look at that image in 2D, uh, if you either remove your glasses or, or just close one eye, you'll see it's quite a confusing image. And um, if you had to put that into people and say, well, look, look at what I found, they wouldn't know what on earth it was. And even more so with this close-up, that it really just looks a bit like a club in 2D, but in 3D, it's clearly a dish. And this was the only specimen that was picked. I was the only one to see it, and I was the only one to photograph it. So it's quite possible that I've seen something unique, and I want to be able to share with the world what, what we've seen. Um, other objects I suppose you're a bit more familiar with. These, of course, are the large white butterfly eggs on my Savoy cabbage leaves, which um, they didn't stay there too long. <laughs> and uh, this nasty critter is called a horsefly, um, which again, I suppose you know that the eyes are more or less globular, um, but uh, you don't want to let one of those bite you. They really are very, very nasty. So um, what I've been doing today is actually using anaglyphs. And I think there are some advantages of that. If you've got red cyan specs handy, just have a quick look. And one of the advantages, I share these with a group of mineralogists, one of whom I've seen uh, viewing at least. Uh, so the large size helps you to see better, but if I, do that in a PowerPoint, then we can view the tiniest little details. And there is a lot of resolution with the techniques that I'm using and in 3D as well now. So um, unfortunately, I've not had the time to really do um, side by sides. I've never done them before, to be honest. I've always done anaglyphs and saved an MPO file. So. Uh, for this meeting, I've had to put together some side-by-side -side sets, but unfortunately, I can't put the text on in such short notice, so you'll just have to bear with that. Um, a bit about the definition, this horribly long word, what's it all mean? Well, the first bit, I'm sure you know what it means, three-dimensional, and the easy way to remember these is we refer to X, Y, and Z, and X is a cross, a cross, and Y is toward you, Y for you, and Z is the forward and backward along the optic axis. Um, now, 
the, the next section, photomicrography, is the photography of objects in the microscopic uh, realm. Um, however, there's a confusing name called microphotography, which is the making of microscopically small photographs that you have to view through the microscope. And they, they often do things like the Lord's Prayer that you have to view down the microscope, which is a bit stupid, really. But anyway, um, photomacrography um, or macrophotography uh, is the photography of, of objects in the macro scale. And that's what we've seen mostly to date, although some of Barry's have stepped over into the micro scale. So what my, macro refers to is image scales up to a scale of one to one. And what that means is if you had a 35 millimeter camera and you photographed a field that's 36 millimeters across, you would say the image scale is one to one. So if you photograph a five millimeter wide object, it will be represented on the sensor or the film as five millimeters wide as well. But if you uh, photograph a field of 72 millimeters, then you would say that's half life size, or it's at an image scale of one to two. The term close up um, bridges an area that's rather general between general photographs, uh, head and shoulders portraits, and close ups may be to a distance of around 10 inches, but it's not defined at all. So there is a great overlap in the definition of these. Uh, the term macro therefore refers to image scales up to one to one. But the actual um, magnification, you might call it, will vary according to the camera that you're using. So on 35 millimeter, if you were to um, photograph, say, the head of a drawing pin, then there'll be a certain amount of uh, spare space around the drawing pin head. But if you photograph the same thing on a compact camera or a mobile phone camera, the chances are that the drawing pin head will fill the frame. And in the latter case, what you would say is that they will have greater magnification, but not necessarily greater resolution. It's more a case of cropping the image down to a smaller size. Um, now the micro part of the word refers to image scales greater than one to one. This is the definition given to these two terms. And so a field width of 18 millimeters on a 35 millimeter camera, you would say is represented at twice life size or two to one. But there's actually not a, a real boundary between the two and one piece of equipment might cover um, from one right into the other. Um, now, traditionally, of course, and many of you will remember that if you wanted to take a one to one scale photograph with your 50 millimeter standard lens on your 35 millimeter camera, you would put on 50 millimeters of extension tubes. And if you add more extension tubes, then you actually step into the micro world. But there is a limit to how far you can go. Um, you, you need to add a lot more extension to get a little bit more magnification. But ultimately, it becomes extremely unwieldy and um, various optical issues start creeping in that we need to get over. So we've got to consider some other methods of imaging things at higher magnifications. And what we need to do in terms of 3D photography, um, when you're doing landscape work, you think in terms of two images taken really in parallel, but separating the two camera images, maybe by 65 millimeters or a bit more. And in the micro world, you need to be thinking in terms of the angle that you take these images at. And that really uh, decides a lot of issues. Um, if you were to use one camera with a, a, a big extension uh, of bellows, then it could end up with the cameras maybe 10 inches apart, but both angled in towards one little object. Now, clearly that's awkward. And there are other ways around of using some of these uh, smaller systems, such as the Lumix one, which I've yet to get to grips with, I must say. Um, now, you, what you can do, of course, is use one camera and then rotate the image so rotate the specimen by a certain number of degrees. Uh, but the problem there is that the lighting doesn't change with the specimen. You, uh, so this, the lighting actually alters. So what are the solutions? The first one, and probably the easiest to use, is a stereo microscope. 
Now, these microscopes um, are defined by having a long working distance between the front of the lens and the stage here, where you can put large specimens in. And you have essentially two complete microscope systems, one for each eye, and they angle in constantly from the eyepiece right to the point of focus where the specimen is. So two separate optical uh, systems angled onto the specimen, and often there's a zoom or a click stop changer. In this case, you can see the big knob there for changing the zoom. At the side of it, this thing, uh, the black thing, is the stereo photo tube that can slide from one side uh, to the other side and capture two images. Now, how do you do that? You could simply put your mobile phone or a compact camera over the eyepiece of the camera, of the microscope, because the camera is acting as your eye would act. So you do need the eyepiece there. Um, it's not particularly difficult. Stereo Photo Maker will handle any differences in rotation, but the, the big problem, I think, probably is that you will be faced with a long exposure time. So you'll need to keep the camera quite stable as the exposure is going on. And this is the system that I've used for the photographs that you've seen already. Um, it's a stereo microscope, which was the research stereo microscope at the time. And up at the top there is where the camera body would go. All the optics are included in that black part of the tube. And that grey tube will slide from left to right to look at the left channel here or the right channel. The block in the middle is a conventional kind of photo tube that diverts the light up to this port, which is used for an attachable camera. In the middle, we've got a zoom system, and on the bottom, we have what's called an objective lens. And that could be important. We'll come to that later. We've got fiber optic illumination and, of course, a stand that you put this on. Um, this is a modern equivalent of that microscope. And the one that you can see there would cost you about £40,000. If anybody's got a spare, they don't want, then I'll have it. <laughs> right. Um, now, if you were to take a 3D image through your stereo microscope, this is the sort of thing you would get. These are crystals called anglesite. And what you will see is it's actually quite um, an acceptable image, but there is no great deal of depth there. And the next one is done by stacking through the stereo microscope. So now everything appears in focus and you can let your eye settle on things in the background or the foreground. Now that one seemed acceptable. This one doesn't seem really quite so acceptable. So here's a single level and here is a stacked image. I'll just go back to that. If you look at that globular crystal down at the bottom there, that brown thing, and it's very much out of focus in the single image. And when we go to the stacked image, everything is in focus and it just seems a lot clearer. Um, so how do we make an image stack? Barry's already touched on that. Um, what I've done in the past is use the focusing controls of the microscope. Uh, there's a limit to how small you can make those, but to be quite honest, um, you probably don't need to be that accurate with it. Uh, people often say that you do need to be accurate with stacking and there's only one reason why you should want to do that is that if you want the stacking software to produce its own 3D image, which it does because it knows the, um, the dimensions of the stack, uh, that's actually much, uh, well, it, it's a far more difficult way to do things actually and you only see an image that rotates around. You don't see it in true 3D like we know of. So. An alternative is that you could put your specimen on top of a focusing stage or something like an engineer's uh, XYZ work table or a lab jack and gradually move the specimen up. Now, ideally, you are supposed to overlap what's called the depth of field. Uh, this is something difficult to define, but to be quite honest, <clears throat> it doesn't matter an awful lot. Um, if you didn't overlap it, you might just be able to see a little area where the thing is not perfectly in focus, but it's not going to ruin your image totally. So it's worth having a go. Um, so once you've collected your stack of images into a folder, then you can load those into one of these three systems. 
Helicon Focus, Zarene Stacker, and Combine ZM or ZP. Uh, the latter one is free, but probably a bit more tricky to use. And the first two, well, Helicon Focus, I think, is around £100 a year. Uh, Zarene Stacker, I think you pay about £100 forever. Um, but I seem to have done all right with Combine ZM. Just beware if you're downloading them that you download the right thing and not some uh, bogus thing that's put on the same website. Um, now, unfortunately, what I found is that using a stereo microscope has some disadvantages. They don't have really the same resolution as a prime lens on the end of bellows. Um, now, that's not actually a big problem, certainly for a projected, uh, projected image or on a computer monitor. But um, the main problem is, in actual fact, the angle that the photographs are taken through. Most stereo microscopes work from between 10 and 15 degrees. But what you need for a computer screen image is six degrees, or if it's projected, it should be four degrees. Um, now, I saw this very early on when I attended the Berry meetings and put some of these images on the, on the screen. And uh, really, they looked so dreadfully hyper that I would say they were unacceptable. But they were fine, actually, on a, a computer monitor. Maybe just a little bit on the hyper side, but perfectly acceptable. Um, but last of all, I often found myself wanting to go higher magnification. What I did with my microscope in order to reduce that angle was to use a low power objective lens on the front. But it, it didn't actually get me to where I wanted to be. But the problem then was I couldn't get the high enough magnification that I wanted. And you can, in fact, put high magnification lenses on the bottom of your microscope, but that increases the stereo angle to something quite extraordinary, 15 to 25 degrees, which is completely useless. Um, so here we're going to have a demonstration of what the uh, variation of stereo angle looks like. And I've used some dune sand that came from the lovely Lindisfarne Island in Northumberland. And I've taken the images at four, six, eight, 11, and 15 degrees. So here we go. Here is the four degree one. And that angle would, would give you a good image if it was projected, but it looks quite flat when it's on a computer screen. This one is at six degrees, which is okay for a computer screen, but would start to look a bit hyper on a projected screen. However, because it's essentially two dimensional, um, there isn't a great deal of depth there anyway. So in fact, moving to eight degrees has just given it a little bit more bump, as it were. Now the next image, 11 degrees, is what you would see through a, a, a traditional stereo microscope which even then is still okay for this sand, but it wouldn't be okay if you're photographing larger objects. Uh, the depth would just be too great. And on some other stereo microscopes, it's 15 degrees. What you can see there is it appears that the grains of sand, sand are all standing on end towards you. Um, but <clears throat> if you're photographing a single solid object, it could look quite badly distorted. So this is what I've moved to now. <clears throat> Um, I've got my camera on bellows with a lens on the bottom. The next thing moving to the right is the stack shot rail, which is similar to the Wii macro that Barry was using. And at the right hand side, you can see the carrier arm of a photographic copy stand. And that will actually rotate. Um, now, this has become both a lifesaver and, and a real bugbear because the mechanics involved in rotating that arm are really very crude. And it's very, very difficult to get the angle right. And very often, as you tighten the thing up, it veers off target. So we're having something made up. Uh, those are the two stacking rails I've mentioned. There are others. Some are very expensive, uh, made in Germany. Um, the optics, often this sort of technology is called ultra macro, but it's actually micro. Uh, the objectives I use a lot are called Zeiss luminars. Lights also made a set called Photars, uh, Nikon made a set, Olympus did, and so did um, Minolta. Uh, they're all getting quite difficult to get hold of, but I think if you can get any of them at all, they're well worth having and trying to use. People also use reversed enlarger lenses on bellows. Uh, other people have been using the lenses out of scanners. So there's quite a, a, 
a field out there. People also use normal microscope objective lenses, and this can work very well, it can give you very high resolution, but it's extremely complicated and um, re really requires a lot of knowledge about these things to be able to make them work properly. This is a set of Zeiss Luminar lenses that come in focal lengths of 63, 40, 25 and 16. And they have diaphragms in them as well, so you can control the depth of field. Normally you would keep the diaphragm open because you get the highest resolution that way. Um, as you know, as you close the diaphragms down, the, uh, the angle, uh, the numeric aperture is called, decreases and therefore your resolution decreases. So, as an alternative to the copy stand, this is where I'm heading now. Um, if you look at the right hand image, if you were to remove that camera with the ball and socket joint, and then I'm replacing it with these items on the left. So there's the rail at the bottom and the carrier plate. This is all really big stuff. It's, that measures about eight by six inches, a rotating stage, and then, um, clamp slider that holds the stack shot and there on the right hand side you see how they go together. Well that's being made at the moment so um, I can't tell you whether it's worked or not but I'm finishing now with a set of images taken with that system. This is some shelly sand from Bambra in Northumberland and there's wonderful things there. You've got sea urchin spines. There's a, a little tiny blue ray limpet there and some other tiny little shells. Um, I don't know what all of them are. You could spend hours looking at this. The red, red shapes are um, segments of sea urchins. This is quite a rare mineral called wallkill bellite, and the, uh, the pale pink one is called anabergite. Uh, most of these minerals I'm going to be showing you now come from the north of England that I've been dealing with in order for illustrating uh, articles in magazines. But look at the field width of that is 0.83 millimetres. I can get down to half a millimetre field width and that is equivalent to looking through a regular microscope at 400 times magnification. But what this is achieving that no stereo microscope can do is achieving a natural stereoscopic view but at very high magnification. Uh, this is a wonderful thing, it's called cerocyte, which is lead carbonate, and, and it's called a V-twin, but gosh, doesn't it look like a, something from, uh, from space? And these are quite rare malachite crystals. This is a, a, a zinc mineral called hemimorphite. It's called that because one end has got uh, a different formation of its crystal, it's got a pyramid on whereas the other end finishes flattened, so hemimorphite. This is the one you saw earlier, uh, malachite, the green balls with mimetite crystals underneath. Uh, a pinkish quartz double-ended crystal from a quarry in Leicestershire. And this is blue azurite with a few malachite balls as well. So these have actually come straight from my collection rather than trying to turn them into squares. So I do like to put the information on the bottom there. Uh, Mimetite. And this is something that collectors rave about. These are fluorite crystals. And there's a particular form where you get two crystals that intergrow with each other. They're called twins or interpenetration twins. And a result of that is that the surface is distorted and you get these ripple marks and uh, they also form very clear crystals so these are very sought after and this is a purple one from north yorkshire or fraser's hush and that's a close-up of them and the last one is an image of a very thin lead halite crystal uh, just stood on its end there from uh, near appleby in cumbria well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was, that was absolutely amazing. The uh, some of the images there are astounding. When it's uh, when you consider how small 
the the actual things are that you're looking at and the, mm -hmm. and the sand and as well is uh, very intriguing what, what it's actually made up of and uh, at such a small scale i th don't know whether they've had any actual questions uh, in the chat there was some regarding uh, recommending serif affinity as a as another stacking software which uh, i was uh, aware of a couple of people were using so serif affinity photo is sort of a photoshop equivalent but yeah. a lot, yeah. lot more substantial cheaper price but it's amazing what it can do as a as a product Picole has also been mentioned uh, and i think it might have been Piccolet that uh, we had a talk at the ISU Congress in uh, in Lubeck. Uh, I forget which uh, which software it was. But uh, spare me while well, I just sort out the uh, review. I've lost myself. I get, uh, yeah, we're just looking at you at the moment. Just bear with me. So has anybody any questions for either Barry, Colin or John? You can either pop them in the chat or there's a raise hand feature under the reactions button on the tool and uh, you'll uh, become visible to us that you've got a question. Unfortunately, with uh, 106 people on the call, I cannot see everybody at once to, to know uh, who was uh, physically waving at me. I just saw something come up about electron microscopes and yes, scanning electron microscopes generally have this facility to be able to be, produce a 3D image. Um, you need a special stage inside it, but it can be done. It's relatively easy. So uh, Jan Robert Williamson in uh, Norway is asking, how do you do the left right shift? I'm not sure. Are, you, are you taking a left and right image? Uh, when you're doing this, or are you using the stacking information to create? No, the, the left and right images are created by taking them at different angles. So just like our two eyes would be looking like that towards a single point, so that's what the camera is doing. So I'm taking one down that axis and another down that axis by rotating the camera around from one point to the other. Right. Okay. So that's, if I understand. Uh, scanning electron microscopes is a similar thing sort of turntable uh, yeah. idea between yeah we've got uh, alan wood of the cricket uh, microscopical club uh, has popped a link in there we did a, a joint meeting with them in london a couple of years ago so welcome to any of their members that have joined us this morning let's try and see what other questions are i don't know whether any of the other co-hosts have spotted anything that i've missed um or if anybody's actually raised their hand, no, can't see anything. So I'm just trying to catch up on some of the chat messages. Uh, uh, Paul Kipps also raises his hand. Okay. Uh, so look, you can uh, if you if you spot them, Dennis, you can uh, unmute them. Uh, ask them to unmute. I'm struggling to see, uh, see everybody. Yes, my question is, are, are any of the crystals toxic to handle that you deal with? Um, potentially, yes. Um, it's also possible that you'd be looking at radioactive crystals. Um, frankly, most of these don't dissolve too easily. There's just one or two do, but, uh, and you know about those, but most of the crystals uh, don't dissolve. So even if you were to ingest them, it wouldn't affect you. Yeah, so, so if, if you bought some from a crystal shop, you know, you see these shops where you've got sort of busted open things with crystals in, are they, yeah. they're unlikely to give you something that's going to kill you? Presumably. I think you're extremely unlikely to get something that would kill you, yes. Um, the one to watch out for from the north of England is called witherite, which is barium carbonate, usually white or colourless, and that will dissolve in your stomach. So uh, that would give you barium poisoning. And you're not likely to find radioactive specimens in shops either. Yeah, and presumably asbestos I just thought of is an issue, isn't it? Sorry, the witch? Asbestos would be an issue as well, wouldn't it? Um, well, 
I, I would have to say yes, but the, the biggest issue for asbestos is for people that worked with it and breathed it in on a daily basis. Um, I mean, I have a specimen of asbestos in my cabinet, but it stays there, so it's not something I play with and um, you know suck air from. And uh, as it stays there, it's fine. Thanks very much. Thank you. We've got a question from Jeff Ogram as well. Just bear with me a minute. Uh, let me find Jeff. There you go, Jeff. You should be able to. Uh... Yep. Yeah, uh, we, one of the things about um, unmuting was that we couldn't do because you weren't allowing it to happen to us. <laughs> so, you you know, you get a message coming up when you're trying to. But I was interested to, um, I just checked something a moment ago because I was, uh, I always think of X, Y and Z axes uh, as being... Uh, Y vertical, X to the right, and Z going at the depth, you know. But when I looked at my crystallography books I did about 60 years ago, I found that you're quite right, of course, <laughs> that the Z is the, is the vertical uh, thing. But so I wonder why that changed. I always feel that X and Y, you know, would be the thing looking at you, the, 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 the plain face, and then Z, Z being the, uh, the depth. It's funny, isn't it? Because it's the other way around. That's where you're looking from. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Indeed, indeed, yes. But that's a bit strange. Because I've always got that in my head, <laughs> using the, the XY graph as being vertical and then the other being depth, thinking in stereoscopy, stereoscopy rather, um, that you've got that added dimension from what you're looking at in two dimensions normally facing you, you know. It's just one of those things. And I wonder why it changed that way. Yeah. Certainly, that's the terminology yeah. generally yeah. used these days. And in cinema yeah. 3D, you yeah. talk about the, the Z depth in and yes. out of the screen. Yeah. The positive exactly. Aspect. Yes, yes, that's right. I'd forgotten over 60 years that we did it the other way around, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. Probably a complete, no, 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 unnecessary no, no. question, but there we are. I, I did notice it myself when John was explaining. I thought, I wonder who will be the first to uh, point out that <laughs> there's a, a, a different way of uh, naming yeah, axes. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Well, no problem at all, yes. You know, I remember the 14 Brave space letters at one time, but I've forgotten them now. <laughs> okay, I'll see if there's any other questions. I, I'm going to leave in a moment because I've got to uh, catch up. I'll see you later on, hopefully. Yeah, we'll see. Thank you very much, anyway. Really excellent uh, morning. Thank you for everybody. Bye. That's all. That's Jeff Ogram, the chairman of the Stereoscopic Society. So, is there any other questions? Uh, I've not spotted anything unless the other co-hosts have noticed. Just lots of thanks and uh, how wonderful your images are, John and, and Barry's as well. There's been plenty of comments and uh, from Collins and so. Just another quick thing about the X, Y, and Z. I'm just beginning to wonder whether it's because in a microscope you're looking down at the object. So, and 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 anyway, it's not like a human that stands up and has a an up, a down, and a and a depth. If you're looking down at it, your depth is actually coming upwards in effect, isn't it? Or am I misreading that? You actually talk about focusing as being in the Z direction or Z stacking. But if you were to look at, say, um, a diagram of a crystal or something, some other object, and they put X, Y, and Z on it, then you could be looking at a page where Z is, is a vertical line. So one's talking about what's on a page and the other's about reality. So as far as we're concerned, as photographers, Z is the focusing direction, and X is the horizontal direction across you, and Y is the, uh, the, the direction towards you. Yeah, thank you. So like all things to do with 3D, there's a numerous ways of interpreting it. It just confuses everybody. Andrew, I notice uh, you were asking about questions. I noticed that Carlton Bright is asking, is time-lapse video of growing crystals possible? Oh, thanks, Mike. It should be possible. Usually these things are pretty two-dimensional, though. So... Um, you would have to construct some system, maybe where the crystals were growing in a petri dish, and if you were, you would certainly have to have two cameras running simultaneously. 
Uh, if you use a stereo microscope, then you would need a camera on each eyepiece running together. Uh, but you couldn't use the other method that I've used by changing the angle of the camera. Seem to think John Hart in uh, Colorado did some uh, shows that might have been uh, to do with the growing uh, crystals a couple of years ago. Mm. Somebody might be able to correct me if, uh, if that was the subject. I know he did some uh, interest in uh, microscope and, uh, and also similar to Barry doing drops and splashes many years ago. I think that was about it for the questions. We certainly were, uh, we've gone a little uh, over time. So thank you, uh, John. That was a marvellous uh, talk. And it was very last minute this last sort of week, 10 days that we caught up and uh, discussed you being able to help out. So I really appreciate that. And similar with, I think, all the contributors this morning, were all quite uh, last minute. To be quite honest, a lot of this convention didn't exist 10 days ago. So th thank you to everybody that's contributed this morning. and putting a lot of hard work, uh, putting their shows and contributions together. So thank you, John. Thank you to uh, Barry and Colin and Derek uh, for his little historical show. And then also Carlton doing his early Australian stereographers and contributions from Ray and Max in Australia and New Zealand. So thank you everybody for what you've been saying this morning. Thank you to everybody for joining us. I'll just give a brief rundown of what's happening this uh, afternoon. So we'll, uh, we'll stop in a minute and then at uh, 2 p.m. UK time, British summer time, we've got a fascinating talk by Tim Goldsmith all about the Vista screen uh, viewing system, which is a very British answer to a sort of view master, if you like, and Tim will be telling us all about it. And he actually interviewed the photographer uh, best part of 20 years ago and so has some very background information on personal stories from from him that uh, not many people will, will know and also be sharing some of the images and of course it was also the uh, system that went on to become uh, Weetabix and, uh, so I think there's a lot of people who know that that's then uh, in a lot of Brian May's books is the thing that inspired him to get into uh, 3D many years ago also this afternoon at uh, three o'clock, I'll then be showing a selection of shows similar to what we had last night, but uh, more uh, general shows, not just the AV5 ones. We've got uh, quite a lot of members shows that have been sent in, another one of the ISU code shows, and uh, some re really interesting, very well made uh, 3D to be able to enjoy. Then we've got an extra item that's been added to the program, uh, uh, thank uh, Tim Goldsmith again, actually, for offering to do a light-hearted 3D quiz. So we'll have a bit of a social hour at 6.30 p.m. The, this evening, British summer time. And uh, I think he was saying the, qu the quiz might take sort of 30 minutes and, and a little bit of social time to round today off. Because I, I didn't want to uh, interfere with the time zones of the New York Stereo Club's meetings that uh, for us in the UK are uh, eight o'clock in the evening and there's quite a lot of us as members are very often in the audience sitting in on the, their wonderful meetings they've been doing weekly so uh, when we finish the, they'll be able to hand the torch over and let them continue so uh, I hope you all enjoy a nice uh, break and uh, we'll see you back at two o'clock so thank you all for tuning in <laughs>